Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me and having me here. It's been a, a long trip from Brussels, an unexpe unexpected long trip uh, to be here, but I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Alexandre Lafilippe. I, I uh, am Vice President and Executive Director of the EU Disinfo Lab, which is an NGO based in Brussels and um, countering, looking forward to countering disinformation um, by um, bridging communities and enabling initiatives that the mission we wrote um, and we are very happy to do so. Uh, today I want to talk, we talk about social media, are social media good or bad for democracy and I think one of the key issues about social media is about um, to have fair and sovereign elections and to do this we need to have fair information. Um, first, uh, I'm really sorry for this, but you'll have to enter into my mind. And at the UD Info <laughs> Lab, we have a very specific mindset, which requires uh, from you a little bit of concentration and focus. So we're going to talk about social network analysis. So to understand this, I need you to think that we are not people anymore. Now, I'm sorry to inform you that what we are are nodes. I am a node, you are a node, we all are a node in this room. This is perfectly fine, don't worry. And as nodes, what we do is that we have interactions. These interactions in a room that can be conversations, uh, the fact that we have our phone numbers in our, in our phones, things like this. On social media is talking to people, replying, retweeting, liking things. And what we can uh, know about interaction so we can give them a direction. So we can say that I'm speaking once, twice, three times, and I'm speaking to you. So I'm giving you information and you receive information. On social media, what is very interesting is the people who receive the information. Why? Because it means that they are followed, that they are um, retweeted, replied to. When they post something, they have feedback coming in. So these are the people who are really influential. So what do we do? From these nodes, we, did different, we give different size. The bigger you are, the most influential you are. And then, since I was a little boy, I was always amazed by the Pissarro and the Impressionist paintings. So I always try to add colors in this. So what we do is to um, use a cluster algorithm, which basically group the nodes that have a lot of interactions together. Why? Because they share interests. They have the same kind of, they follow the same people, they are, uh, interested in the same kind of things or they share the same hashtag or same narratives. So we group these people together because they have something in common, they share information together. And we give them different colors. Once they are grouped, we specialize them to understand what are the different communities at stake. So now you're going to get home tonight and say, okay, we are nodes and that's perfectly fine. The work we did was to um, understand in different elections um, in 2017 and 9, 2018, uh, how different communities and different networks are talking about elections. What we did was to focus primarily on what we call the Kremlin network. So basically this map you see is a network of people actively retweeting, um, replying or mentioning Russia Today and Sputnik uh, during, three mo during three months before the French presidential elections. This is helping us to understand what kind of people are spreading Russian propaganda um, in the merge, in the edge of the French elections. So basically what we see here is that what we have is we have one community which is close to François Asselineau, which was a very small candidate, conspiracy candidate. We have one community supporting François Fillon and another one supporting Marine Le Pen. So this helps us to understand what kind of political communities are ready to spread Russian narratives. But then what we did at the same time was to look at all the people spreading rumors during the campaign, rumors that were not directly spread by these media outlets, but like were spreading around on social media. So we did this for 12 rumors that were fact-checked by the cross-check project in France. And what we did basically is to understand who are the people talking about this. And what we saw there, we saw three communities, one still supporting Mrs. Ms. Le Pen, one supporting Mr. Fillon, and one supporting Mr. Sarkozy. And the very small one you see here are the people from the Macron campaign trying to debunk all the rumors, but they are really small because they are not engaged with uh, the debunking. And what we did at, this, at the time of the election was to compare all the similarities between the different databases. So th we showed that the more rumors you spread, the more chances you have to be inside the Russian activist. Uh, community. So that means that you have people that are ready to share anything that they can use 
as an information, as a weapon. Because it can be a false information, it could be something from that media outlet, that media outlet, they don't care. They just use it to weaponize this information. Because we did this, we were able to um, monitor all the people spreading misinformation and disinformation during the campaign and to understand what was the purpose of it, what were the people uh, uh, close to these narratives, and then we were able to detect what kind of narratives are emerging or buzzing. The example of the Macron leaks is a very good example. So basically you are two, uh, three hours before the end of the campaign, so before the media embargo when you cannot talk about the election anymore, and you have a leak, a false leak, coming from the US and trying to disrupt the presidential election. So the team, because we were monitoring everyone on the rumor side, we were able to detect that something is using this path to produce something that is wrong. The path that have been taken by the Macron leaks activists in the US and in France was the same path that have been taken three days before on a rumor during the presidential debate about an offshore account of Emmanuel Macron. So what we did was to gradually tell journalists, tell civil society, look, you have something going on. We d we're not fact checkers, we, do we cannot check if something is going on. We can only say this is going from these communities. And you need to understand that if you're going on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere, if you, if you read this, you need to know who shares this, who started this, and what is the path of information. And to know that these paths of disinformation have been the same path proven to have other disinformation operations before. So you give a context to information. You don't verify the information, but you give the context that gives people time to think and give also journalists time to work on the, on the debunking, on is it fake or not. So basically what we did was to expose uh, all, the, all, the, um, all the different data we have. So basically the first, the first tweet from Jack Pozobiec, then the role of WikiLeaks into, uh, into spreading the Macron leaks, um, then we have the last tweet of the Macron campaign was to retweet our researcher to show that this was going on and that you need to have narrative ready for the election day to be sure this is not going to be a, a major um, unknown subject of discussion. And after the end of the campaign, because we are based in Belgium and not subjected to French law, we are able to continue the communication and showing what were the people that spread all of these rumors before the election and after the um, and after the uh, media embargo. The impact of doing this is really clear. We have at 10.30 p.m., so basically 45 minutes, uh, one hour, sorry, after the first tweets coming from the US, in green you have only English-speaking communities basically based in the US, uh, US alt-right uh, spreaders, talking about the Macron leaks, and you have in light pink here um, activists from Front National and also people that were very keen to uh, spread some rumors during the French elections. When we do the same map at midnight, we see that for the first time the communities have merged into one. So you have like this all green one is both Front National activists and US alt-right, which is very uncommon because usually when we do these kind of mappings, we see that people that don't speak the same language don't mix together because of language issues. So they cannot retweet themselves because they don't understand what they're saying. Uh, because French people don't speak English and US alt-right people don't, don't speak any language. I think. <laughs> <laughs> and then in purple, you have all the, what we call it, the liberal community. Like all the people, journalists, trying to understand what's going on and trying to give another narrative to the story and to trying to reverse the effect of the bubble of this spreading. What we learned during the French elections was to, very usually, the main learning was disinformation is launched by off the grid stakeholders, is always by people you don't expect them to send something. So the big media outlets like Russia Today, they don't launch rumors like this, but they use it. So they make it, the, the rumors grow, and at some point they can take it and say the internet is saying this, and they, they give a context to information. That's the, the second point. Foreign stakeholders played a central amplification role in the, in the French elections. And then the political echo chambers were deliberately targeted. When you look at the fake, the copycat of Le Soir newspaper about Emmanuel Macron being funded by Saudi Arabia, if you look at the first tweet that's being said, you have people that are deliberately targeting people who hate Emmanuel Macron to be sure this can be taken by these communities. And in fact, the story became big because uh, Marion Maréchal Le Pen tweeted the story natively. So, 
and then it goes through all the thing, all the echo chambers and the particular echo chambers. Then what we did was to go to Italy, because first I love pasta, which was a very good reason to go there, and the second one is to trying to reproduce the methodology we had in France and to see can we apply this methodology to other countries. Then different, we have different uh, problems with Italy, which were not the same like in France. In there we have parliamentary elections, which are very different because you have a large political party numbers and you don't have this presidential figure that we have in France. It, where it's really easy to polarize. In Italy you have much more different political parties and opinions, so it, it's, uh, it, uh, it uh, diffuses the, the risk of uh, having big uh, disinformation operations. Then there you have a Russian proximity with political players. Um, um, Russia has been close to many political parties in the past, uh, from uh, Silvio Berlusconi to Lega Norte to uh, other political parties. This is not um, a secret. Um, then we have uh, no uh, strong fact-checking background. We don't have a lot of fact-checking initiatives in Italy, uh, and especially in newspapers that we have in other countries, which was also a very big issue. I'm going to skip this. So we did the same kind of things, trying to understand the different, um, the different communities there. So we took the um, Kremlin network again. So we tried to understand what kind of people were ready to spread this kind of uh, Kremlin narrative during the uh, elections. What we saw that we had three communities. One was um, close to the far right in Italy, um, mainly uh, um, people from uh, uh, Lega Norte or Casa Pound parties of Fratelli d'Italia. We have a, uh, a community close to uh, Cinque Stelle, activists from Cinque Stelle. And we have this community which is full of Eurosceptics. And I, when I say Eurosceptics, it's not only about the European Union, it's about the currency, about NATO, about everything that is close to, to Europe. And then we spotted different stories during the campaign. I don't know about this, uh, if you know about this one, this was uh, uh, two weeks before the end of the campaign, the Train Italia migrant story. So one morning on Facebook, you have this picture of, of a man, uh, which is posted on a private profile saying, and the comment of this picture is, I'm sick of all these migrants getting to the train, not having any train tickets, um, and uh, we Italians, we pay for everything. Yes, thank you. Um, what is very interesting in this story is that first it was debunked very um, quickly uh, by, by Trenitalia uh, because you cannot get into these trains in Italy without having a ticket. So the problem with this gentleman was that he was seated at the wrong place and the controller of the train just like asked him to go to the right place. Second thing that is very, uh, very, uh, very interesting is that um, this reached more than 85,000 li likes and shares on Facebook on day one before having one single tweet uh, about it on Twitter. Why? Because in, in, in Italy, Facebook has been much more used to spread these kind of narratives, and uh, Twitter used as an echo chamber, especially as an echo chamber for debunking. So the, f the first stories we see here, we have a few bots, like three, four uh, bots talking about the story in Italy, but the main conversation about this story in Italy is about bloggers who debunk the story said, I've seen this on Facebook and I want to tell you why it is wrong. Then on the day before the election, we have this hashtag coming out, Soros Lengua Cinque Stelle, which was then only purely Twitter um, fed. The thing is about this is you have one very isolated Twitter account, a thing that we saw in the French elections, with these um, screenshots of alleged open society documents for grants. And inside these documents, in these two documents, you have three lines and you've been explained in a very poor English that basically uh, open society is financing every other political party but uh, Casa Pound, which is um, uh, a far, very far right party in, the, in Italy. And this has been posted by a, a very isolated account who had no tweets, only five replies, created in January 2018. And then it has been uh, quoted like in 15 minutes by all Casa Pound activists. So it really looks like an operation to make things big and trying to um, uh, undermine uh, all the political parties um, during the elections. And then we have my favorite stories, uh, the, the fake ballot story in, um, in Sicilia. So this has been published the day before the vote and has been spreading the day of the voting elections. The story of this is very simple. You have this um, story about 
in Sicily, you have uh, uh, ballots, voting ballots, with the logo of the Partido Democratico on this. This is not true. There have been a, a problem with voting ballots in Sicilia. The problem is that they were directed to the wrong constituency, so they had to restamp a lot of ballots. But like one hour after this story being pushed online, what we saw that we had this website called Il Fatto, which looks like Il Fatto Quotidiano, which is a newspaper um, uh, really close to Cinque Stelle. You have this uh, Il Fatto website using this about doubling the number of ballots that needs to be reprinted, um, and then also saying that you have the logo of the Partido Democratico. So in one hour only after the story came into the local press, you have this story on, on, a, on, a, on a website. What you have then, you have um, a, a Facebook page linked to the website that tries to push it on Friday night, on Saturday night, doesn't go very well. They push it again on uh, Sunday morning, so day of the vote, and then it, it explodes on, on Facebook. Where it was the second most discussed um, story of all the campaign in only one day. And what is very interesting is about this is that you, you have mainly people, activists from Cinque Stelle, tweeting the story a lot. And even after the debunking, the spokesperson um, of, the, of the party tweeted again the story and tagging all Cinque Stelle officials in the public tag to be sure that this story was continuing to spread even after debunking. So what is very interesting uh, for us after these two elections is to understand that first, we have operations that can be taken off. Um, you have different ways of doing it. Um, social media are used at some point to spread these operations. You can have all the copycats, the website copycats you want to have. You need at some point to address it to people. And for now, social media platforms are a good way of addressing things to people. The problem is right now that we're able to do social network analysis on some uh, social media platforms, but some of them are really black boxes. So we don't know what's going on. We don't, we don't have data to perform this. We don't know if the numbers are true. We, and we don't know how it circulates. Because of, thanks to social network analysis, we're able to understand what kind of community is spreading misinformation, what kind of people are talking about this. And this is giving a clear context to information and helping to understand what's going on. And the problem is, if you don't know what's going on and you only have a number of likes, shares, and you don't know how people see this and how people are interacting with this, I think it's, it's a much more complicated problem to, um, to understand what's going on. And this is going on and on. A very important thing also to keep in mind is that all of these techniques are evolving elections after elections. And what, you, what we see here is not today, it's already the past, and it's already the far past. And what is going on today, we have absolutely no idea. So we need to um, keep on um, searching, to keep on having data, and I think the social media platforms should do uh, more into uh, releasing data access to researchers and third parties.